you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, talking. I appreciate everyone who was able to make it here, all of our speakers. Thank you so much. It is so great for you to be here and to have this support. It is very warm in this room tonight as opposed to last year when it was very <laughs> yeah, cold. cold. Ice cube. Other years it was raining. We huddled under the, the portico, under the Capitol. But uh, this year, I think uh, we're doing it right, and uh, hopefully we can repeat this experience from here on out. Uh, before we take stock of our debt, I just wanted to mention uh, we're making more progress every year. We've had some great victories this year. Um, of course, the hate crimes legislation on the federal level. Uh, I believe we had a very good uh, decision in the uh, federal circuit court in D.C. with the trans woman who was... Uh, denied a job at the Library of Congress and um, all kind, all sorts of municipalities and states all over the nation are passing gender identity inclusive anti-discrimination laws and that's a great thing. And even across the street we had the situation with Dandy Beth Glenn who was fired when she transitioned. Uh, I was reading some of the deposition, uh, reading about some of the depositions the other day in the paper and it looks like uh, we're on our way to uh, some very positive case law here in the 11th Circuit. So that's something to celebrate. But of course we're here because every year too many transgender individuals and gender non-conforming individuals both here in the United States and worldwide are, are subject to violence and murder. And it's been a terrible, terrible year in Latin America this year. It's been a terrible, terrible year in South America this year, in addition to the United States. And for that reason, we just cannot afford to be silent, you know. All of these new laws are great, but as we recall, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to grant women the right to vote did not end sexism. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not end racism in this country. And the hate crimes law and hopefully the end of that we pass this year and next will not end transphobia and anti-transgender violence. So it is for us, the living, to become visible because if we don't stand up in our hometowns in middle Georgia, and south Georgia, in the mountains, to be counted, we're not going to make any progress. <coughs> when, when President Ahmadinejad of Iran came to the United States recently, he made the assertion that there were no gays in Iran. Well, that's absurd. And everybody knew that was absurd. But too often in legislative halls, uh, county, state, and federal, we hear, we hear lawmakers say, well, we don't have any transgender people in our district. <laughs> it's just like Harvey Milk said, we can't be invisible. It's just like the act upset, act upset. Silence equals death. In this case, invisibility equals death. We, we have got to be visible. We have got to stand up and be counted. And we cannot rely upon the same, same folks doing the work. We need, we need new blood every year to stop the transgender blood from flowing. And if you have not been involved with anti-discrimination legislation, if you haven't written your congressperson to ask them to please pass the end up, I ask you to do so. We cannot afford to be invisible. And before I hand off the mic, I just want to tell a little story. Some of you have known me for a while. I, I grew up in Griffin, Georgia, which is this town about 45 minutes directly south of here. And my parents, uh, growing up, they weren't really churchgoers, but they grew up Southern Baptist. And so they would send me every other week to my grandmother's down in Thomaston, Georgia, to go to church from a very early age up through my adolescence. Every other weekend I would go down and spend the weekend with my grandmother Roberts and we would go to the First Baptist Church of Thomaston, Georgia. And at the First Baptist Church of Thomaston, Georgia, there was this preacher named Ed Cliven. Truly a man of God, if there ever was one. 
Reverend Ed Clyburn said the kindest things about my grandmother at her funeral seven years ago. Several years ago, I'm sorry, it was 2005. And, and it was the first time, because he had been retired for several years, and it was the first time he had, he had seen me in years and years and years and years and years. And he always likes, and he knew me because he always liked, liked telling this little story about how when I was seven years old, and at the end of every Southern Baptist service, the preacher will get off the podium and ask everyone to come up and, and accept Jesus into their life and be saved. And, and I was at church sitting with my grandmother, and she would give me a little prize if I was good in church every Sunday, and there was only one time I never got that little prize, and that was that Sunday. I had to use the bathroom so bad. So when Reverend Ann Clyburn came down and asked people to come to God, I just could not wait. I got up and walked down that aisle, and he says, Oh, here comes little Jamie to give his life to God. And I just looked up and said, I've got to use the bathroom. <laughs> Exactly. The whole auditorium just burst out in laughter. My grandmother, Roberts, was mortified. That was the only Sunday I never got my prize. So, so he told that story at the reception after my grandmother's funeral in Thomaston, Georgia. And then after he finished, he goes, so, so where is little Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I walked up to him and said thank you so much Reverend Clyburn for the kind words he said about my grandmother and he looked at me and he grabbed my hands and he held me and says all I want to know is are you happy and I said yes Reverend and he said well that's what matters Story and pass the mic on. Thank you so much again for being here. Thank you.